Please be seated. As our children and their leaders go out to junior church, yes, I'm getting the nod from the back, then I'll just say a short prayer for them. Lord God, we thank you for the blessing of children in our church, our families, our community. We pray that you will watch over them, keep them happy and safe, and help them to learn this morning something of the truth of your word and your gospel. And we thank you for their leaders who are doing this for them. And we thank you that they're jumping around enthusiastically, which I think is a good sign. Amen. So we turn to our service sheet for our order of service today. Please sit or kneel to pray. (laughs) Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, Yet ought we most chiefly so to do when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying with me. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus you, our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent, and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We say together, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O oh Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. <coughs> Please remain standing as the choir leads us in our psalm. 139, which you can find in your prayer book on page 595.
Please sit for our first reading. The first reading is taken from Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 11, which can be found on page 1134 of the Pew Bibles. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Here ends the first reading. Please stand as the choir leads us in singing the Te Deum.
Please sit for our second reading. Reading is taken from Matthew, chapter 13, verses 1 to 9 and 18 to 23, the parable of the sower. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered round him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow, But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered, because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Listen, then, to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. This is the end of the second reading. Please stand as the choir leads us in the singing of the Benedictus. Thank you. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us and grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the King. And mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. Endue thy ministers with righteousness, and make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people, and bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, because there is none other that fighteth for us, but only Thou, O God. O God, may clean our hearts within us, and take not Thy Holy Spirit from us. The Collect for today, the sixth Sunday after Trinity. O God, who hast prepared for them that love thee such good things as pass our understanding, pour into our hearts 
such love toward thee that we, loving thee in all things and above all things, may obtain thy promises which exceeded all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defence, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who hast safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by thy governance to do always that is righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand as we sing together hymn number 238.
Please be seated. When I was a child in the 1970s, I attended a Sunday school where one of the leaders was my dad. Every week there was a game where the leaders would call out a Bible reference and the first child to find it in the Bible and stand up and read it out would win a toffee. Goodness me, that beats online gaming every time, doesn't it? I soon worked out that my dad picked the same verse every week. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. I memorized the verse and then leapt to my feet every week to quote it from memory and win a toffee. It has remained in my memory ever since. And you're going to ask me to prove it now, aren't you? Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. You can give me a toffee at the end. <laughs> Maybe because of this, this section of the Bible encompassing the end of Romans 7 and the beginning of Romans 8 has for many years been my favourite. I was delighted when I saw that I would be preaching about it today. When I went to my own personal authorised version of the Bible to prepare for this sermon, I was surprised to find the bookmark in place at Romans chapter 8 until I remembered that my youngest son Alfred had read the whole chapter at my dad's funeral three years ago from that copy of the Bible. The reason I love this section of the Bible is that it explains the whole essence of the Christian gospel of salvation perfectly and succinctly. Writing for a mainly Jewish group of Christians in the embryonic church in Rome, the Apostle Paul himself, an accomplished Jewish religious teacher, explains how Jesus is the fulfillment of the Jewish covenant with God. This was very important for Paul's readers as they would have been resistant to a call to reject their Jewish identity to embrace a new religion. Paul is therefore at pains to explain that the new covenant of Jesus is the natural next step in the ongoing relationship between God and his chosen people, the Jews. A next step, though, which radically includes Gentiles, too. Romans chapter 8 starts with the word, therefore. This indicates that what Paul is about to say follows on from what he has just said, and, as such, is not a good place for us to start reading. In the seven preceding chapters of the book of Romans, Paul has painstakingly built an argument based on the impossibility of anyone relying on the fact that they are a good Jew to win salvation from God. Because the Jewish law is impossible to keep, argues Paul, it can only bring condemnation rather than salvation, as well as requiring intricately complicated religious observance of rules involving food and many other rituals, the Jewish law also requires a love for God and a love for other people that no man's sinful heart could ever achieve. Religious people then, as now, had persuaded themselves that trying their best to be as religious as possible and harshly judging other people who are not religious enough would be enough to get them into God's good books. An identifying feature of being Jewish is circumcision. But Paul argued that even this most important badge of Jewishness was not enough to win favour with God. 
Circumcision has value if you obey the law, argues Paul in Romans chapter 2. But if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. In the next chapter, in Romans 3.23, Paul famously states that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If Paul's letter ended here, it would be depressing indeed, leaving us, its readers, both Jews and Gentiles, condemned to eternal separation from God because of the impossibility of living up to the high moral expectations of the Jewish law. But Paul is preparing the ground, having explained in detail the problem of separation from God because of our sinful nature, to explain to us the solution, a solution that will free us from the condemnation of sin and bring us into communion with God himself. We cannot behave righteously because of our sin, says Paul, but we can have righteousness credited to us by the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God made man for us. All we have to do is to accept this gift from God and place our faith in this Jesus rather than in our own religious practice or good deeds to be made right with God. In Romans chapter 3, Paul says we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Later in the same chapter, Paul says, we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. In chapter 4, Paul says that Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. He goes on in chapter 5 to state, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Which brings us back to that word, therefore, at the beginning of Romans chapter 8. We stood condemned before the law, but have put our faith in Jesus Christ, who gives us salvation through his gift of grace and love to us by going to the cross to die for our sins, and rising from the dead. Because of this, we are not condemned, because we are in Christ Jesus, not because we are religious, nor because we are good, but because we have placed our faith in him to act as our advocate before God the Father. People who have a grudge against the Christian faith sometimes criticise it on the grounds that it just makes everyone feel guilty by telling them that they are miserable sinners all the time. But that is because they have not listened to the whole story but have switched off halfway through. Yes, it is true that in the prayer of humble access that we said at the beginning of this service, we did refer to ourselves as miserable offenders. And it is true that at the beginning of 1 John, we read that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But this is just to prepare the ground, to explain that we should be condemned before going on to rejoice in the fact that we are not condemned because God, in his loving mercy, sent his son Jesus to take our condemnation on himself when he died for us on the cross. If you put your faith in Christ, you are not condemned. Anthony always chooses hymns so very, very well for our worship, and in a moment we'll sing the words, no condemnation now, I dread, and how true that is. When God looks at you, 
He does not see the sins you have committed, but only sees the perfection of his Son who dwells in you. In Isaiah chapter 43, God says, I am he who blots out your transgressions and remembers your sin no more. In Psalm 103, we read, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. In Isaiah chapter 1, God says to us, Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Put your faith then in the crucified and risen Jesus Christ. Believe his promise that by doing so you will not be condemned in the eyes of God for your sins, but rather that God will forgive you and embrace you in love. Finally, do not carry condemnation in your heart. If you are not condemned by God, then you cannot be condemned by anyone else, nor can you condemn yourself. Allow God's Holy Spirit to release you from feelings of condemnation because of what you might have said or done in the past. God does not want you to feel guilty. God does not want you to be condemned. He wants to release you from guilt. This truly is good news, the good news of the gospel of Christ. Amen. So please stand as we sing together hymn number 588.
or kneel for our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Everlasting God, we join together in praying to you for the needs of the church, the world, our communities, and ourselves, trusting in your love, which reaches out from before the foundation of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, help us not to get carried away by man-made rules, which can encourage us to pass judgment on others. Give us the grace to repent if we have caused offence in this way, and to look to you only for guidance. Guard us against self-righteousness and all the rules and limit, limits which you would not own but keep always before us the rule of love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, give us ears to hear and minds to understand the message of immortality for the children of your kingdom so that we may look forward with patience and confidence to that time when we will join you in the peace of eternity. We especially pray for any we know who have recently died and are on their journey to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear God, again, we are facing extreme weather conditions in many countries. We pray for all those who are affected and who may be suffering because of them. And we pray for all who are working hard to find ways of slowing down the damage to which we have all contributed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. At times, Father, we are overwhelmed by the number of people known to us that we wish to pray for. Perhaps now we can use this moment to pray for someone whom we haven't brought before you for a while and ask forgiveness for this lapse. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, we thank you for the opportunity of being together in prayer. As we look forward to the week to come, we pray for an awareness of your love and support in all that we do. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So as we come to the end of our worship this morning, uh, please do stay and have a cup of coffee with us afterwards. I'm grateful to those people who have provided that for us. I don't know about you, but all this 16th century English has made me very thirsty indeed, so I will be very near the front of the queue. And remember from this morning that you are not condemned and I am not condemned. We are not condemned because we have an advocate in heaven, Jesus Christ, 
who pleads for us before the throne of his Father God. That's good news. Let's say together the words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. So we finish by singing together hymn number 721.